Good morning, everybody. How you doing today? Good morning. Awesome. Well, I'm excited that you are here. We're going to have an awesome morning. I hope that everybody had a great Thanksgiving uh, this past week. Um, we are... I think I already said this, but we're going to have a great morning together. Um, if this is your first time with us, be prepared for awkwardness because awkwardness is all around us in life, and uh, we're no exclusion to that. Uh, I'm going to fill you in on a big secret that is no secret at all and that there's nothing special about us. So if this is your first time here with us and you had expectations of perfection, we have failed you, but there's something awesome about the God in which we serve, and we believe that he's doing some great things in here and in this community. So we are excited to worship together. We're excited to hang out together as one family, and we're going to get started with a song to make sure you're awake, alive, and as excited as I am. So why don't you all stand and sing with us now? Praise to you. A thankful heart for all you do. For all my days I dwell in your house, oh Lord, I know I am safe here with you. And I run, I run, I run to your goodness. And I dance, I dance, I dance in your presence. And I In the Father's arms I am secure The battles raging inside my heart are one I know I am safe here with you And I run, I run, I run to your goodness And I dance, I dance, I dance in your presence And I live Church, let's sing that again. Sing it out. And I run, I run, I run to your goodness. And I dance, I dance, I dance in your presence. And I lift my hands for all that you've done for me. Come on, in the valley. And in the valley all alone. And we My God won't look away, Father, my heart will say, I am safe here with you, safe here with you. And I run, I run, I run to your goodness, and I dance, I dance, I dance in your presence, and I lift my hands for all that you You all sound beautiful this morning. Why don't you go ahead and greet somebody around you real quick, and then we have a video to show you. Hey Journey Church, we just wanted to thank you guys for your generous donations this year for our Thanksgiving bags for our community. We were able to feed almost 100 families this year between us and Little Flock Church. And so we're so grateful for you guys. It's been a great day to be able to hand out these turkeys and the hams and the food bags to all the families in our community. And we can't thank you enough for your support. All right. 
yeah. Thank you guys so much for your generous donations. We love being able to give back to our community in any way that we can. And we love doing it this time of year, especially uh, as well as the rest of the year. But thank you guys for your generosity. It looks like we're missing a few people. It's probably hard for Louisville fans to get out of bed this morning. I get it. And so I'm just kidding. I don't talk smack. That was just, I couldn't pass it up. So uh, so anyway, so a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, if Grinchmas, all right, so let's talk Grinchmas. So the good news is Grinchmas is back and it's three nights this year, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Grinchmas is our Christmas offering for the community. We have this big thing. We turn this whole building into the story of Grinchmas. We announced that we were releasing tickets on Black Friday at noon. They sold out all 3,000 tickets in like two hours. So that means if you're here or watching online, you did not get an opportunity to get Grinchmas tickets. Except for the fact that we held back a certain amount of tickets that we released today at 1.30 and are only available through the Journey app. So if you have the Journey app, or if you don't, it's a free app, it's our church app, download it today if you want tickets to Grinchmas. They're completely free, but you need to download the app to get those because we don't want those going out in the public and getting swooped back up again. So if you're listening to my voice or if you're watching online, today at 1.30 there'll be a push notification go out as well as a link on the homepage to download your free Grinchmas tickets. Now, if you also op- op- volunteer, I got stuck on my words there, volunteer at Grinchmas, we will have special times allotted for volunteers to be able to go through it with their families as well. But it sold out quicker than we even anticipated, which is a good problem to have, uh, but we knew we wanted to save some tickets back for you guys, so make sure today that you get on there at 1.30 if you would like to get some tickets for Journey. Completely free like I said. Also, we had these Christmas ornaments a few weeks ago. We have our annual volunteer appreciation dinner. Uh, it takes over a hundred volunteers every week to make this thing happen. And so we every year get together and do dinner for them and have a fun time. And we gave them free ornaments. We had a bunch left over. These are available in the Welcome Center for two bucks or in the um, merchandise area for two dollars. It says Merry Christmas. It's got a thing with that. Uh, feel free to pick those up if you want a Christmas ornament on your tree. It smells like a campfire. It smells awesome. I'll probably just keep smelling it all service. Um, <laughs> It smells really good, but you can also paint it because it's wood and all that stuff. So those are just available until we run out for $2. And then also, we'll bring her up at the end, but we have Casa out in the lobby uh, today. And we want to make sure you guys stop by there, especially if you're interested in volunteering and learn more about Casa. They do amazing things in our community, especially for our kids. And so we'll bring Jennifer up at the very end of the service and talk to her for a few minutes, but make sure and check them out. Now, we are wrapping up this toxic series we've been in. If you have missed it, we, we hope that you go back and listen to the messages. If you're watching online or listening later on the podcast or whatever, make Make sure and check out the previous messages. But today, especially, uh, I've already gotten so many comments about today's message just from the first service. And um, here's how we want to end. We want to end a little differently than than maybe you were expecting. But today, with with the idea of toxic, um, I don't know about your experience, but I have grown up in the church. My dad was an elder at the church that we attended. Uh, I've been in ministry for 20 years now. And um, the thing is, when it comes to Christianity, but really any religious kind of expression, um, is generally presented in a way that what happens over time is it almost always tends to gravitate towards behavioral conformity, right? And, And so you have to behave a certain way, you have to look a certain way, you have to do things a certain way. And if you do these things, then you're accepted and included, but if you don't, Um, This may not be the place or the faith system or the religion for you. And so this is very universal to all of this. Um, If you've grown up in church or attended churches, um, there sometimes is this anxiety when you go to a new church. What's it going to be like? Am I overdressed? Am I underdressed? What are they going to talk about? Am I going to feel comfortable? Am I not going to feel comfortable? And so there's all of this anxiety. And then if you become a part of that church, uh, what you find out is sometimes there's a lot of rules you have to follow. Um, I know churches, not us, believe me, I know churches that they want like your tax ID numbers and so they can make sure you're given enough. I know churches that, um, you know, that, that they want to know about your previous like relationships so they can investigate. I mean, all of this stuff that's just crazy and insane. Um, but if you've ever been in a religious environment and felt some anxiety, you're not alone. A lot of us have felt it. And a lot of this stems from this deep commitment to religion. And we're going to talk about that today. And and part of the reason that so many people leave Christianity um, or left a church is because a couple of reasons. Either you couldn't keep the rules and you were asked to leave. You didn't want to keep the rules, so you left on your own. Or let's just be honest, sometimes the rules just don't make sense, do they? 
And so one of the things I found when we started the church, and we'll talk about this more, was there were so many things that people were confused by when it came to church and faith that had nothing to do with Jesus at all. And it was just stuff that we kind of added into the mix that people now have all these opinions and thoughts and feelings about. Now, the other thing is this, is that when you're a part of a religious experience or you're a part of a church, the things make sense. Does does that make sense? When you're in it, it makes sense, the things that you're doing. If you ever step away from that, and believe me, we want to pick on other faith systems, um, we believe some weird stuff, right? And we do some weird stuff, okay? And so, but when you step away from that, all of a sudden, some of those things just look kind of weird, don't they? And you might ask the question, like, well, why did I do that? Why did I feel the need to do that? And sometimes it's just weird, but let's be honest. Sometimes the things that come along with all of that, they're not just weird, they're harmful, and they hurt people. And not only do they hurt people to kind of go along with our, our messaging, sometimes they're toxic. You don't have to raise your hands, but has anybody ever been part of a toxic religious environment or messaging or group of people? Because I have. So today I want to talk to you as we wrap up this series, not about a person or an individual that may come into your life, although this may be part of that, but this idea of toxic religion. And here's the thing, if there's anything in the world that's creating more spiritual anxiety and sickness and and heartache and hurt around the world, it's toxic religion. It's the idea of taking the purity and the goodness of the message of God and perverting and polluting it by religious connotation. And this is not new. In fact, this has been going on since the beginning. So early on in the church, in the book of Galatians, so Paul is a Jewish guy who is actually a Pharisee. So Pharisees are like, and we're going to talk a lot about them today, Pharisees are like the religious leaders or lawyers of the day. Their job was to make sure that everything was explained in a way that it made sense to you, and especially if all of the rules were being followed. Okay, And, and so he grows up as a Pharisee, but then he meets Jesus, and everything changes for him. He now identifies and sees things differently, and he sees the danger in religious Um, ideas. And so he's more about this relationship and commitment to following Jesus. And so he goes around and he plants churches in these communities. One of the early churches that he planted is in the place called Galatia, which is the Galatian church, okay, which we get the book of Galatians from. And in this, he goes in, he starts a church, he empowers the leaders, and then he leaves. Now, there were two groups of people that kind of followed Paul around, and these may or may not be familiar terms. The first are the Gnostics, and the second is the Judaizers. If you listen to our Divinely Uninspired podcast this week, you heard us talk about Gnosticism and Gnostics a little bit. But the other one is Judaizers. Judaizers were people who basically said, we want to follow Jesus, and you should too, but you have to follow all of the rules from the Old Testament as well. So you can't just say, okay, I want to follow Jesus. You have to keep all of the rules from the Old Testament. Now, one of the rules that was a little bit tricky that they wanted people to follow was they said, in order for you to follow Jesus, you have to follow the Jewish law. And part of the Jewish law is that you need to be circumcised. Okay? Most of the people reading this or hearing this would have probably been Gentile men. And someone comes along and says, you have to be circumcised. If you're a child, earmuffs. All right, for everybody else, all right, if you don't know this. Now, here's why I say that. I was thinking about this, okay? Think about it from a practical standpoint. It's hard enough for me to get men to be baptized. (laughs) Can you imagine if I said, oh, and this has got to happen too? Meet me in my office after the service, right? Like, imagine this. What this did is it caused a lot of tension, unnecessary tension. And so Paul hears about this, and he's furious. And so he writes this letter, and he opens the letter. And if you read Paul's letters, they kind of op- usually open with like this kind of warm welcome. This one does not. Here's what he says in First Galatians chapter 6, okay? He says this, I am shocked, speaking to the church, because they've allowed this to happen, this religious idea to come into connotation and into play. I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God, who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Jesus. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news. All right, see this. He's saying, this is not the good news. What they're asking you to do is not the good news of Jesus. See, see, here's the thing. The word gospel, and we're going to talk about it, literally translate good news, which means that when you hear the gospel of Jesus, all right, you should not be fearful of that message. 
But this is causing fear and anxiety in these men specifically because of what's being asked of them with this a religious idea. But he goes on to say, this is not good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. And this is what religion does. Religion is often used to gain advantage and power and leverage. And the way that people gain advantage and power and leverage through religion is twisting it. And it's mainly men, historically study it, mainly men who use it to control, abuse, and gain leverage over people. This is the danger of religion. Now, the Greek word that is used right here, another translation that Paul talked about, is the word pervert. The word pervert is matatuso, which basically means to corrupt, to distort, or to poison. In other words, it's toxic. And what he's saying is if you allow these religious ideas to come in here, it can be toxic to the good news of Jesus. And so what I want to do is take a few minutes and talk to you about the two most common ingredients that I see when it comes to these religious ideas interfering with the goodness of what Jesus actually came to do for us. The first one is this. And maybe you've seen this based on your history. Maybe you've seen this based on your past or your experiences in other churches. Um, But the first one is this. The first temptation in religion is to focus on the external rather than the internal. The temptation is to focus on the external rather than the internal. Essentially, look how I perform. Everybody look at me. And what we do is we say and we acknowledge there's a gap between a holy God and a sinful me. Okay, that's what we do. And in order to close the gap, what we often do is we believe if we perform in a certain way, then we can close that gap. But let's be honest. A lot of times our performing that and to close that gap is not about God at all, is it? It's about other people thinking that we're closing the gap, thinking that we're holy, thinking that we're righteous, thinking that we are the only ones able to keep the rules and therefore we're able to be closer to God than everybody else. What often happens in this idea when it becomes about the external and not the internal is this. It often reduces Christianity down to a bunch of rules. And that's what causes the anxiety. Because you don't know if you can follow the rules. Sometimes it's not even clear where the rules are. And because of that, you never know where you stand with God. It was common in the day of Jesus, and it's common today. In fact, we'd already mentioned the Pharisees. This is a group of men, the religious leaders or lawyers, as they would be referred to. A part of their job is to keep people in check and keep people in line with the Old Testament law, which is not 10. We'll get to this, but it's actually 613, all right? And most of you guys have felt at 10, probably today already. And so 613 is out of the question. But here's what these guys do. They go around and they make people think that they're keeping all the laws because what they do is they tend to focus on these external laws, which make them look holy and righteous, And that's the temptation of religion. And here's what Jesus says to those same Pharisees that are doing this and making other people feel bad about themselves. He says this, Woe to you, Matthew 23, 25, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Essentially what he's saying is the temptation that they experience and that we experience is to make the outside look really good but inside, nothing's, nothing's gotten done, right? It's still dirty. It's still yucky. It's still icky. The Pharisees were known that they would go on the street corners and they would pray these big, bolsterous prayers to make people think that they're really holy and connected to God. And not only would they be praying these things, but they would also dress a certain way so that people would think that they look like holy and, and religious. And, and they, oftentimes what they would do is they would actually even go to the temple so they'd say these big prayers, then they had these outfits on that make them look just like, you know, robes and all this stuff. And then they would go to the temple and they would make sure that everybody was paying attention. And then they would dump all of this money that didn't come from them. It came from stuff they took from other people, by the way, and put it in the offering. And they would say, look how holy I am. This is their temptation. And then we see this over and over again in that culture. And Jesus acknowledges this. But part of this is this. For them, it was about how they look to everybody else. And Jesus hated this, and so do 
I. When we started Journey, um, one of the things that I did, okay, was I went to McDonald's up here. We didn't have a Starbucks or Cedar Grove coffee shop yet, so I went to McDonald's, and I would sit there, and when people would come in, I didn't know most of these people, I would offer to buy them lunch if they would sit down and talk about church with me, which totally sounds like a cult in hindsight. I get it, okay? <laughs> like, it probably wasn't the most strategic thing, but here's what I would ask. I'd say, hey, if you want to sit down, I'm not trying to get you to come to my church. I just want to talk to church about you. And I would sit down and I would offer to buy them a Big Mac meal or whatever they wanted if they would sit down and talk to me about church. And here's what I learned. The number one thing that people were concerned about when it came to church in this area, I can't speak about everywhere else, was how they dress. I had one lady specifically, it always stuck with me, that she went to a church on Easter Sunday. This is a true story. And she put on the best clothes that she had for her and her kids And she walked in, and nobody said anything. It wasn't like a judgmental thing, but she felt embarrassed, and so they left. True story. So that's why you'll never see me in a suit unless I'm at your funeral, okay? (laughs) You'll never see Now, if you want to dress nice, that's fine, but we don't want that to be a distraction to people or one of those barriers they feel like they have to cross. The other thing that people told me was they said that when they went to other churches, and I'm not saying we don't do this because we probably do, but what happened is they're presented with one thing, And then as they get more involved, it ends up being another thing. And so they're offered bread and then hit over the head with a rock. You know what I'm talking about? And it's the idea that at first it appears this way, but as they get to know the people and know what's going on, there's all these rules and things they have to follow that they didn't know about at the beginning. And so it becomes about this outward thing. As long as everybody looks good and looks nice and all the rules are being followed within the church, it doesn't matter internally what's happening for anybody. It's all about the external. In fact, in many ways, what Journey has become was born out of my reaction to the outward religious experience I saw in the church. I grew up in the external show. And because there's an external show that exists in churches, some people feel welcome and accepted and others don't. Some fit in and maybe you don't. And I'm going to tell you this about Journey, and hopefully it's been your experience. If you're religious or not religious, if you've got a lot of money or no money, if you wear the right labels or the wrong labels, if you're black, white, yellow, orange, purple, highly educated, not educated, we don't care. Everybody's welcome here. You just are. And here's the thing. We know, ready? We're all messed up anyway, right? Me included. And so, it, listen, you've got some problems, lots of problems. It doesn't matter. See, this is the toxic idea between religion, is turning people away from God based on things that have nothing to do with God. So the first thing is that oftentimes religion focuses on the external rather than the internal. The second thing that happens a lot of times in religious environments, especially toxic ones, is it promotes spiritual pride. Here's what I mean by that. It's this idea that we are right and everybody else is wrong, right? 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 It's existed back then, and it exists today. And Jesus despised this. In fact, he went out of his way to tell a specific story we're going to look at a little bit today um, about this, about people that were so proud of their religion, but completely missed the point. In in Luke chapter 18, there's a story that Jesus and his disciples, they're watching this scene. It's like they're sitting there, and they're in the temple, and they're watching this unfold. And here's what he says. He says this in this parable that he talks about, they're kind of seeing. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, we have to stop there, okay? Because, see, we introduced the Pharisees a little bit. These are religious leaders of their community. But then we talk about tax collectors. Tax collectors and their community were the worst of the worst of the worst. So Jesus is putting literally two extremes. You have the Pharisees and the tax collectors. The tax collectors were so bad, sinners were offended if they were included with the tax collectors. That's true. That's why when you see in the Bible, it always says there were sinners and tax collectors, all right, because it was so bad. And so these two men go to the temple at the same time. You've got the super hyper-religious and the guy that we would all say from an external standpoint is completely far from God. The Pharisee, goes on to say, stood up and prayed about himself which is the temptation of religious ideas, isn't it? To make us look good, right? God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, robbers and evildoers and adulterers, or even like this tax collector. 
that's got to feel good to be used as the illustration, right? <laughs> I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. In other words, look how great I am. And especially in comparison to this person or that person, I'm awesome. And this is the temptation of religious spiritual pride is that, that, that you've got it all figured out. What we do is we judge other people. We put down other people. We, we create separation between us and other people. And in turn, sometimes what that communicates to people is their separation between them and God. A few years ago, uh, this, is a, <laughs> this is a true story. It happened about three or four years ago. I can't remember exactly the, the time frame, but um, there's only a few people that I think know this story. Um, <laughs> so I met Starbucks. I haven't told this people to a lot of people, story to a lot of people, so don't let it leave the room, okay? And if you're online, just turn on for TV for a second. Um, so I'm in Starbucks, and I'm wearing a Journey shirt, because we love our Journey shirts here and our sweatshirts. I mean, my whole wardrobe is basically Journey stuff. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm on my laptop. It's like three or four years ago. I'm working on my sermon, and this guy in front of me keeps looking over at me. Now, I don't say this to be like pump up my ego or whatever, but we, we have over the years, and this is kind of in pre-COVID, the height of Journey's growth, and so we had... Lots of people attending Journey, and if you know, we've talked about before, like, the average person in Journey attends two times a week, and, and so essentially, we had a whole bunch of people attending Journey. I didn't recognize all of them. The other thing is, when I'm looking around the room right now, just a little secret, you think I'm looking at you, I'm not. There's points on the wall I look at. I, I don't see anybody's faces <laughs> at all, and so, I'm, you know, it's kind of fuzzy, like, is this person that comes to Journey or not? So they keep looking at me. I mean, I've been in, like, Kroger's. I've been in, like, places and, you know, it's one of these things where, you know, people talk to me and, you know. So anyway, he looks over at me and he, he finally eventually says, you go to Journey. And I'm like, yeah, you know, kind of. And, uh, and I wasn't sure if he was attended. And, and then eventually I was like, yeah, I go to Journey. You know, so you saw the shirt. And he's like, yeah. So I'm just assuming that it's somebody that's familiar with me from here. And, you know, sometimes you meet somebody one time. It's kind of you're trying to figure out where you saw him from. And then this guy says this. He says, well, my pastor says your pastor doesn't preach the truth. <laughs> and that you guys are dangerous. Now, 28-year-old Jeremy would not have handled that situation well. But 37-year-old Jeremy, uh, three years ago, a little bit more maturity. Um, I, I, and I've gotten to this place. I don't have time for these type of conversations anymore. And so all I said to the guy was, maybe you should come on Sunday and see for yourself. You know, that's all I said to him. Now, I don't know if that guy ever showed up, but I would have loved to see the look on his face if he did, and I walked out on the stage. <laughs> now, I tell that story because it's kind of funny, but I also tell that story because it's a true story. And here's the thing. I know the pastor he was talking about. I've had coffee with him. I've been in prayer meetings with him. And a non- Christian world looks at stuff like that, and they say, why would we ever want to be a part of that? You can't even get along yourselves, because there's all this spiritual pride, this hypercritical, joyless, cynical, judgmental, judgmental, hypocritical, we're right, and everybody else is wrong. A few years ago, I told our staff, there was some stuff that came out. It was during the time where people were like on All About Shepherdsville. <laughs> it's just so much fun sometimes. So I hate Facebook, but I love All About Shepherdsville. And there were some things on there where people were like looking for churches. And of course, everybody, when they see that, gets on there and starts talking about their church. And there was something that came up and there were some people kind of attacking Journey. And <laughs> so I saw this. I logged in one day and saw this because somebody texted me about it. And, you know, I went to all those people and I said, don't engage in this. I said, don't engage in this. I said, and do not feel like you have to defend Journey or me. There is nothing to defend here, okay? And, and I even said this to our staff. I said, it's hard sometimes. I have to fight this. But listen, we don't do that. We are for other churches. We're not against them. And the reason that we're for other churches is because we are for people, because God is for people, and churches are made up of people. And so we don't need to criticize them. We don't need to come up with religious, spiritual pride and that we do it right or whatever. And listen, if you believe in what God is doing here at Journey, that's great. But don't dare think it's the only way or the best way. It's just a way. 
It's an expression of what God is doing. And religion can often come up with this spiritual pride where it makes you believe that we are better and they are worse and that we're right and they're wrong. And I'm telling you, a non-Christian world looks at that and goes, why would we ever want to be a part of that? See, Jesus didn't come to make us religious. He came to set us free. Full of joy, full of life, full of victory, unity, love, and compassion for one another. Those are the words that are used by Jesus and his other followers for what he came to do. And what happens is religion, it poisons, it destroys. We said earlier, the word gospel literally translates in the Greek, the good news. Which means that if someone hears the good news and their response is, that doesn't sound like good news, we probably didn't present it in a good way, did we? See, some of you grew up in churches where it was confusing, wasn't it? Here's the good news, but it feels like a trick. See, the good news of the gospel is this. God sent Jesus not to make us religious, but to set us free. And religion is a return to bondage. Did you know that? It's letting go of one set of bondage and attaching yourself to another set of bondage. And that's not what Jesus came to do. Now, to, to, to explain this, because it sounds confusing to some people, I want to use a, a story from Jesus' life. And, and when I read this verse, you're going to be like, I don't understand why that's so important. The people that heard this the first time greatly understood how important what he just said was. And basically what happens is Jesus is walking around doing ministry, and he happens to do something that isn't even like a big deal, but he does it on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the day of rest for the Jewish people. It's in like the original 10. It's like really important to them, but it's this religious idea. Part of what we have to understand is why the Ten Commandments, but why the law was given in the first place, okay? And that's a really important thing that we could spend the next 45 minutes on, um, but we don't. But you got to understand that it was given in a context, in a certain environment, and what they did was they took it and they made it something it was never originally meant to be. So these Pharisees are calling Jesus out, okay? Now imagine this. Jesus is God who gave us the words that made up these laws, and they're trying to call out Jesus for his own rules, supposedly. I mean, this is insane. So here's what he says. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Now, you read that, and even in reading it, you might be a little confused why this is such a big deal. But here's why this is such a big deal. He's talking again to a Jewish audience who this has been a big part of their life. And when he says this, It's a shift of epic proportion in their understanding. Because essentially what he's saying is this, and this is important, okay? God did not create people so there would be someone to follow his laws. You catch that? God didn't create people so there would be someone to follow his laws. The Sabbath was made for man to keep man healthy. You weren't made for the Sabbath. The law, the ideas that come out of that, were made to keep man in a place where they could love each other, be neighborly to each other, be able to keep community together. It was made for man, not the other way around. But here's the problem. When we get that turned around, when we get that confused, when we do that the other way, and this may be harder for you to believe, but, but here's the thing. God loves you more than he loves his commands. God loves people more than he loves the rules. And when we get that reversed, people get hurt. Religious leaders have been leveraging this backwards for generations. And specifically in the life of Jesus, when religious leaders used the law of God to manipulate people made in the image of God, Jesus was quick to remind them they were on the wrong side of God. And that may be the very reason that many people in this room watching this or people that have been a part of our church struggle so much with organized religion, specifically Christianity. 
So I'm going to give you a couple of things to unpack today. And the first one comes in Romans chapter 3, verse 20 and 22. And I'm just going to read it, but you should look it up later. It, it, the book of Romans, by the way, if you don't know, is Paul is Roman. He's Jewish, but he's also a Roman. And he wants to go to Rome desperately, and he keeps getting told no. So he eventually writes this letter, the book of Romans. I remember all the letters in the New Testament, they're written to specific churches. And this is like his like passion is to get Rome on fire for Jesus and what he's done. And so he writes this letter, and he doesn't want to mess anything up. And, and so that's why the, Ro- the Roman letter is so much longer than all the other ones that he writes, but he's very meticulous about what's going on. So a lot of fascination with all that, just for me maybe. But here's the thing, okay? So Romans chapter 3. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. You may not have known that Bible verse actually existed. Paul is saying, and listen, you got to understand, Paul has forgotten more about God and Jesus than anybody in this room, maybe all of us combined, will ever know. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous, which means being made right with God by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin, but now our righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known. So we're not going to get right with God by following the law. You can't try to follow the rules. It's not going to happen. But there's been a new way, a better way that's been made. This righteousness from God comes from faith in Jesus. That's what he says. So let's break down that verse into three kind of points. The first one is this. You cannot earn God's acceptance by observing the law. Religion always says you can please God by your external works. Right? That's the belief. That if I do enough right stuff or if I live a certain way, and I'm not saying living a certain way isn't good and healthy and maybe even makes you a better human being. But to say that's what gets you right with God is not true. Remember this old saying, I don't drink and I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't run with girls who do? Remember that, right? That was a popular saying years ago. Do you know where that that saying started? Churches, all right? Or maybe this, I don't go see rated R movies. Yeah, right. I read the Bible. Okay. I give money, all right? I don't cuss unless someone goes slow in the fast lane, right? And so we feel like we're right with God because I'm better than somebody else. Paul says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. So if you can't be made right by the law, why is the law given? Well, the second point that Paul brings up is the purpose of the law is to show your need for a savior. That's what it's intended for. And here's what he says. No one will be declared by observing the law rather than through the law we become conscious of our sin. And here's why. And this is important. Because being someone who's hurt, broken, and sinful doesn't disqualify you. It's a prerequisite. Okay? It just is. You, listen, if you won't admit that you're hurt, broken, and filled with sin, and I'm not even talking about in a religious context. Forget Jesus, God, Bible. Okay? You're messed up. We're messed up. So let's just take a look at the Ten Commandments from a religious context, right? Has anybody in here ever told a lie, right? If you say you didn't, you just lied, you automatically told a lie, so you just broke the Ten Commandments. In church, by the way, all right? <laughs> anybody ever lusted? I mean, I like to talk about that at church, but like it's part of life, right? Jesus said if you lust, you actually have committed adultery in your heart. Uh-oh, right? <laughs> everybody ever coveted something? Wanted something that your neighbor had? Envied something? That's just five. We got five more to go, and we've all already failed, haven't we? And so what it does is the law shows up, and this is this religious stuff, but it shows you that that doesn't work, that you need a Savior. And then Paul says this, Righteousness with God comes by faith in Christ. What religion does, and what a lot of times happens in a lot of churches, unfortunately, but especially, and we like I said, the Gnostics and the Judaizers and these groups of people, what a lot of times they do is they try to say, it's Jesus, yes, but then there's all this other stuff too. It's Jesus plus whatever. It's Jesus plus circumcision. It's Jesus plus membership. It's Jesus plus you have to give a certain percentage. It's Jesus plus all this behavior modification. It's Jesus plus this. What Paul says is the righteousness from God comes through Christ to all who believe. And I've said it a bunch of times, but what I love about the Greek word that's used for all is it literally means all. It's not a trick. 
Does this include someone that doubts from time to time? Absolutely. Does this include someone that's a sinner? Absolutely. Does this include someone that's messed up their past? Absolutely. Does this include someone that grew up in church? Absolutely. Does this include someone that has religious tendencies? Absolutely. Anybody who puts their faith in Jesus will receive the righteousness of God. They'll be made right with God. And it's not based on what you do or what you've done. It's based on what Jesus did. Now, imagine growing up in a religious context, a religious world, where you got to follow all of these rules, and there's all this anxiety because you never know where you stand with God, and you got to go slaughter a bunch of animals and do all of this ritualistic stuff to try to feel right with God. Imagine being that, and someone comes along and says, you don't have to do any of that anymore. Well, you might be tempted to say that's good news. Jesus did not come to make us religious where we return to bodges. No, he came to do something else. Now, here's the temptation. And I've heard this. Here's, here's what people push back on. Now, if that's true, what's going to happen is, Jeremy, all these people are going to come to Jesus and they're going to get saved and then they're just going to go and do whatever they want to do, right? Because they got to get out of hell free card. Okay. Well, let's take this all the way through, okay? Those of us that have put our trust and our faith in Jesus, all right, what do you do? Whatever you want. All right? Isn't it interesting that when that excuse is using, it's always about other people. It's never about, well, maybe I'm the one that came to Jesus so that I can do whatever I want. Right? You know what that is? That's spiritual pride. That's the nervousness. That's what religion does to you. Here's what Paul says. So Paul says, okay, when it comes to this religious connotation and kind of dive into it and be a part of it versus what Jesus has done for us, here's what he says, and it's in Galatians, and I'm not going to read it off from a slide again. I'm just going to read it. You should look it up. You should actually read the whole book of Galatians, all right? Therefore, I have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. So here's what he's saying. If anybody has the right to try to say that I'm good enough to earn it on my own after his conversion, it's Paul. Indeed, if others have reason to feel confident in their religiosity that they can make their way to God, that he says, I have an even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old, which is like the appropriate time, not as adults, to circumcise somebody. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was zealous that I harshly persecuted the church, and as for righteousness, I obeyed law without a fault. Now, when he says that, think about this. Paul is saying he obeyed the law as he understood it without a fault. I don't think he's being facetious. I don't. I think he followed the law and his understanding of it as best as he possibly could. So if anybody has a religious way to get to God, Paul's probably the guy. And he says, I once thought these things were valuable. And that's what me and you do, don't we? We think those things are valuable. I do. I want people to think I'm great. I don't want all of you all to believe that I got it together. I don't, all right, at all. I once thought all of these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage. And here's the word. That word garbage, I would be embarrassed to tell you what it really means that he used there. So that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I became righteous through faith in Christ for God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. When you really understand what Jesus came to set you free from, there should only be one natural response. And Paul tells us in the next verse. Do you know what the natural response is when you come to find out who Jesus actually was, not the version of him you were sold? He says in verse 10, And for that, I want to know Christ. He doesn't want to abuse it. 
He wants to know more about this man who has done this thing for him. He wants to follow him. Not out of a religious effort to please him, but as a response to his goodness and his love. Listen, people hate religious, holier than thou, hypercritical. It's an outward show. It's a look at me show, right? We don't like it. What Jesus came is to offer us something completely different. So there's this Pharisee, and he's standing there, and he's, you know, he's praying this prayer, and it's like this big thing, this big show, basically. And then there's this tax collector who hobbled in with probably very little to give, because he's probably already spent everything he had for himself. He doesn't have any of the pedigree that anybody would want. And so he's standing there, and this other guy prays this really impressive prayer. I mean, it, it was like a scene that like, if that's the guy, you're like, that's the guy that should be preaching, right? It's the guy that should be leading this thing. And the Bible says that Jesus says, he wouldn't even look up to heaven. He's so ashamed of who he is, he wouldn't even look up when he prayed. Do you know what his prayer was? It wasn't even a good one. It was, God, have mercy on me. That's it. And do you know what Jesus said about this? He said this. I tell you, that man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. Because it wasn't about some religious showing. It wasn't about what can you do to impress God. It was about, will you accept the love of God that he gives freely? Know who you are and who he is and what he's come to do and what he's come to set you free from. He didn't come to take you back to a performance bondage, but to set you free. And my hope is that for us as individuals, see, some of you in this room, maybe you feel like the tax collector. You know what I heard the most when in between services? When people are like, you remember that part you talked about people beating you up and giving you one thing and telling you another thing, and tricking you and making you feel bad about yourself? And then, you know, do you know what most people think a religious experience is? If I made you feel bad about yourself. And you're like, oh, he made me feel really bad. It was a good sermon today. All right, I felt really terrible about myself. That's not good news, is it? May we never get that confused. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your day. this day. We thank you for the gift you give us of the grace that you give us so freely, of the love you give us so freely. God, I just pray for me and for everybody in this room that we don't ever get this confused. God, I know for some people it's confusing that I'm up here on a stage bashing religion. But God, I, I, I truly believe I am not a religious person, but I am someone who is deeply committed to following you because of what you've given me. And that's a second, third, fourth, tenth, fiftieth chance. That your grace never fails. And it's not based on anything that I've done or anybody else in this room has done. And for that, we should be eternally thankful just for that. Because we're messed up. But you love us. And you love us so much that you gave your son. Not to start a new religion. Or a new idea that's going to but just to give us freedom, to give us relationship, to give us grace, to give us hope, to give us a chance. And we should be eternally thankful for that. So God, maybe with some of this garbage that we've got in our minds and our hearts, maybe God, you just get rid of it. Help us get rid of it. Help us to work through it and to turn back to you and, and the goodness of who you are. Father, we love you and we thank you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. We come to this time in the service where you get the opportunity to respond to maybe what God is leading in your life and and the the things that maybe he's saying to you now. Uh, This is also going to be a time where we're going to worship together and we're going to start off worshiping by taking communion together. And I want to remind you that as you take communion, as you drink that juice, that that represents the blood of Christ that's been poured out for each and every one of us. And as you eat that cracker, remember that that represents the uh, body of Christ, that he willingly went to the cross. He laid down his life for each and every one of us. That it's not about 
how good or how great we act. It's not about how good we can become. It's not about the great things that maybe we could do for God. That's not why Jesus went to the cross. He went to the cross because he sees so much value in who you are because he created you. That before you could do anything right, he gave everything for you. So that we may have life and we may have life to the full, as he says. So maybe right now you, you feel some wrestling with, with maybe uh, your past and, and what, what, uh, uh, what God is saying to you now. And that's okay. This is a time for you to ask questions. Maybe you need to just ask God some things. Maybe you need to physically ask somebody. Uh, get somebody. Go down there and get Jeremy. Whatever you need to do, take the next steps in following Christ this morning. This is also going to be a time where we worship together. We're going to sing songs together. We're going to unite our lives together around one thing, and that is that Jesus Christ is King of our lives and of this world. And that your sin and your shame and your guilt has been washed away as soon as you receive him. So whatever you're going through, whatever life looks like right now for you, know this, that you're not alone. That each and every one of us are going through everything just like you are. And that now is a great time for you to make the next steps in your journey. like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy and all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us so like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory in a i 
Overcome by the grace in his eyes And if grace is an ocean We're all seeking So heaven needs earth Like an unforeseen kiss And my heart turns violently Inside of my chest I don't have time to make these grits when I think about the way that he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Come on, church. Yeah. God, as we come into your presence now, God, I pray that we would surrender everything that we have to you. God, and where our words fall short, Lord, God, I pray that our hearts would just pour out to you. That you would fill our hearts with you now. you would change these words into prayers. God, that we would see your face and your face alone. All my words fall short And I've got nothing new How could could sing these songs as I often do but every song
Won't you give shy of me, lift up your song? As you got a lion inside of those lungs, get up and praise the Lord. Come on, church. Pour it out to him. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Carried a burden too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation.
Amen. Thank you so much for letting us worship with you. If you don't mind, go ahead and have a seat. We have a guest with us today. Yeah. Okay. So this is Jennifer. She is with Casa. And so say hi to Jennifer. Yeah. Hi. You know, it would have been really funny. You said we had a guest. And I was thinking about toxic religion. I went to a church one time that if you were a visitor, they brought you on stage at the end. So uh, anyway, that would have been awesome. But anyway, uh, so anyway, so she's with... <laughs> <laughs> Not you, that's for sure. All right, so this is Jennifer with CASA. They're a great organization that we partner with the community and want to extend our partnership with them. They do great work. And so, Jennifer, if you don't mind, just take a second and tell us what CASA is. So CASA is Court Appointed Special Advocates, and we advocate for abused and neglected children in the court system. It's a group of volunteers that do the work. Yeah, and so they go on behalf of the kids and help with that. And so they do great work for our kids in our community, especially those that don't have a voice for themselves sometimes. And so we want to support what they're doing. And, we, and like I said, we always want to give away stage time uh, for people online or in the room so you guys be familiar with who some of our partners are and who we want to partner with. Uh, but the other thing I want to give our opportunity to say is what can we do as individuals to help you guys out? Okay, so there's three things that I like to tell everybody they can do. You can obviously volunteer to take cases and work with the children in the court system, but you can also volunteer and donate your time. Um, there could be a certain skill set that you guys have that we could use in the office to, you know, work toward the bigger picture and our mission with helping the children. And lastly, if it's not you, maybe it's somebody else. Maybe you know someone that's interested in the work that we do. Um, just learn more about us and yeah. spread the word. And I know that we didn't say it's first service, but I'll make sure and get it in the notes. Um, Give Tuesday is this week. So there's several organizations in our community that we partner with with Give Tuesday, and it's a way to give back. And so you can make donations. I saw you had a Facebook page, I think, too, that didn't go on there. And if you want to know anything else about CASA, even if you're just unfamiliar with them, we've been familiar for years, and you did really amazing work over there. And so make sure and just stop by the table. If nothing else, from what I've heard, you got amazing chapstick down there. Yeah, yeah and so, good. but stop back there, sign up to volunteer, because I'm sure there's ways ways to volunteer throughout the year other than even doing cases, but they do need caseworkers as well. And so make sure and stop by and say hi to Jennifer. And so thank you for being here with us. Thank yep. Thank, thank you, you everybody. Thank you, Jennifer. All right. I'm going to let Nathan pray us out. Don't forget, download the app Grinchmas at 1.30. Little hint for you guys. They're actually already available right now if you go on the Journey app, but there you go. All right. Yep. Get them while they're there. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we love you. God, and we praise you and we thank you that, that you're a God that, that looks on us with mercy and love. And so, God, I pray that as we leave this place, as we go through life, God, that we surrender who we are to you and we, we allow you to control um, the things that are going on around us. So, God, we love you and we praise you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Have a great week.